on behalf of the Friends of the Hadley Library. Um, we're very happy to have Tom Clark with us tonight, who's the uh, director and curator of the Botanical Gardens at Mount Holyoke, and um, I'm a very good speaker, so I hear. And the pressure's on, Tom. No pressure. But anyhow, before we get going, I think everybody knows there are refreshments in water there if you need it. And also, mm -hmm. I want to call your attention um, when you're getting the refreshments of passing by. We have some upcoming programs in, um, excuse my voice, um, we have a book and bake sale coming up on May 6th, is it Pat? Yeah. yeah. Um, that uh, will be here at the library. And then we have another speaker who's an author coming on May 13th, am I correct? <coughs> excuse me, who was the, um, remind me of her name? Cheryl Wilson. Cheryl Wilson, okay, we got an echo here. Um, who wrote Valley Gardens, and she's, <coughs> was the, she, uh, she was the writer in the Gazette for their gardening column for a huge amount of years, I can't remember. So, um, so anyhow, take a peek at that. You can take a picture of that with your phone. Please, we're going to be sending it to you by email and online and everywhere else we can pick up. So <laughs> if you forget the information, that's fine. But anyhow, welcome, Tom, and welcome, Alex, from Hadley Media. We're so happy to be here do our uh, filming for us for the few that can't make it. Thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Linda, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak here in the first place. And thank you all for being here. It's uh, quite an honor. It's my first time in the new library, so what a wonderful <laughs> space this is. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about myself, but I do feel that, you know, I think all of us are asked at some point, at one time or another, you know, how we end up doing what we do, or what our career path, where we started, basically. And uh, I grew up here in Hadley. Uh, I live in Granby now. But um, I can distinctly trace the foundations of my passion for plants, my interest in horticulture, to a few different things. One thing is my parents, who are here this evening. And uh, the support they provided, the guidance, the uh, opportunities they provided were formative and uh, always encouraged me to follow what I'm passionate about. Uh, the other thing was uh, working at the Hadley Garden Center. I, when I was a sophomore at Hopkins, I was hired by Ed and Fran Macro, the original owners of the Garden Center, and then went to work for Tom and Jeanine Giles for many, many years, part-time. And that experience was formative in uh, kind of setting me on my path, uh, my career trajectory in many ways. And then finally, I think, uh, just having grown up in Hadley, um, in a community that has such a rich agricultural heritage of people depending on growing things, and uh, you know, just being immersed in those uh, the cycles of the seasons. And again, growing things, I think that seeped into my being and having the experiences of, of living in North Hadley and being able to explore Mount Warner and the floodplain forest down along the river. All those things kind of laid the foundation for what I went on to do, which is explore my passion for plants, which I continue to do. Um, and I'm really excited about this gardening season. My wife and I just got back from a nine day trip to England where all we did Every day, just tour gardens. It was wonderful. It was heaven. And we didn't have any rainy days, which was quite remarkable. Um, but anyway, I'm excited to be here and um, talking about herbaceous perennials. And perennials are such an incredibly diverse and varied group of plants. And they find their way into our gardens in so many different ways. And there's so many different ways to utilize them, whether it's in a more conventional or traditional sense of uh, you know, lush perennial border. Uh, or whether it's the, the layered woodland garden that some of us may endeavor to create in, in our gardens, where herbaceous plants form a tapestry of color and texture and floor to floor, um, overshadowed by a shrub layer and then a canopy of high shade. Uh, or maybe we're endeavoring to create a rock garden where herbaceous plants from the higher, higher elevations of the world, the mountains, uh, we bring those into our gardens to create um, a scene that's naturalistic and mimics in some way the environment we might find in the mountainous parts of the world. Uh, or maybe we're bringing perennials into our garden for a specific purpose. Maybe we're all about creating habitat and home and food source for pollinators, whether it be butterflies, birds, <coughs> hummingbirds, uh, or perhaps we're really into growing flowers to cut and to arrange to uh, enhance our indoor spaces. Uh, or perhaps you don't have a garden at all. Your garden is restricted to containers that you have on a patio or a back deck or something like that. Perennials can find their way 
into a variety of containers, whether it's a rock garden trough on the right there or a collection of uh, carnivorous plants. We see in the middle there a little bog planter or various uh, succulents in a container. Uh, perennials find their way into containers. But I think for a lot of us, uh, simply creating a, a garden, a planting, a space that we can enjoy and um, spend time in and just to beautify our landscape. And this is uh, one garden that my wife and I have created at our home in Granby. And uh, that's a big part of what we do is just enjoy what we've created and enjoy growing plants. Um, but before I go any farther, I want to kind of touch on a couple definitions. Um, the world of herbaceous plants can be really divided up into three broad groups based on the life cycle of those plants. Uh, annuals, biennials, and perennials. And I'm guessing that a lot of you know have some familiarity with those terms, but I just want to review them because it's easy to get them kind of mixed up in our heads a little bit. Uh, annuals are those plants that grow for one season. They start the seed in the spring, they flower like crazy through the growing season, and then they die in the first frost or the hard freeze in the fall. Think marigolds, cosmos, zinnias, things like that. Uh, the next group is less well known simply because they're not as widely grown. And those are biennials, by two. So biennials complete their life cycle over the course of two years. They germinate from seed. And the first year, all they do is produce leaves. There's no show, there's nothing. They're just growing leaves. And of course, leaves are important because those are little solar panels that collect the sun's energy and through the process of photosynthesis, feed and nourish some plant and create sugars. And it's really the basis of life on Earth. Uh, plants are absolutely essential to life, and that cannot be overstated. Um, but anyway, so biennials spend the first year just collecting energy, uh, creating carbohydrates. And the second year, they call on all those carbohydrates to send forth a, a flush of growth the following year when they flower, and then set seed, and then it lights out for them. Uh, but the subject of the talk this evening is all about perennials, and those are the plants that grow for more than two years. Uh, and typically much longer if they are selected carefully and given the basic care they need. And generally, perennials will flower reliably year in and year out, you know, again, if they have the, the basic care they require. And although some are evergreen and may have persistent stems, for the bulk of perennials that we grow, they die back completely at some point in the fall and over winter as roots and a crown that's just below ground. Um, I think when most people think of perennials, this is kind of the, the group of plants they think of. Not these exclusively, of course, but this type of plant. Things like daylilies, uh, anemones in the lower left, beautiful delphiniums. I wish we could grow like that around here. Um, and then, of course, the vast daisy plant, the vast daisy sunflowers, and that's a type of inula there. So this is often what people have in mind when they think perennials. But I just want to broaden your perspective on kind of how I'm approaching the world of perennials. and. Uh, you know, creating this very broad umbrella under which there are all manner of plants, including ferns. We have a wealth of ferns that we can grow. We have a richness of ferns that are actually native here. We can also call on a lot of ferns from other parts of the world that are perfectly good garden subjects that bring a lot to primarily shaded gardens. Um, ornamental grasses. They began having a tremendous heyday back in the mid-1980s and the surge of interest and uh, attention that ornamental grasses are getting continues to this day. Um, bulbs of all sorts. Uh, if you come to the flower show down at Mount Holyoke or the one at Smith, all those plants that are on display, the tulips, the daffodils, the hyacinths, the glory of the snow, all those things are all perennials, as are lilies and snowdrops and a whole wealth of other, other bulbs. Orchids. Um, all orchids are perennials. Now, the vast majority of orchids in the world occur in the tropics and the subtropics, but a lot of people are surprised to learn that we have probably 30 or 40 species of orchids that grow native right here in New England, terrestrial orchids. Now, a lot of them are rare, endangered, very localized, but there are some that make very good garden plants. I'm not going to be talking a lot about orchids today because that's a subject for an entirely <laughs> different talk, but they're out there and they are herbaceous perennials. A lot of succulents. We may know sedums, but there are also cactus that are also herbaceous plants. Mosses, of course, are herbaceous plants. Water plants, they're also herbaceous. Um, a great many hardy carnivorous plants, like many of the pitcher plants, they too are herbaceous perennials. But a lot of those require kind of very specialized care or specialized conditions in which to grow. So I'm not going to talk about 
carnivorous plants and orchids and bog plants and things like that. I'm going to focus primarily on plants that can be grown with relative ease in most of our gardens, I think. Um, plants like this, um, many native plants that we have find their way into our woodland gardens, whether they're native here or like these gems from Eastern Asia. They create the backbone of many wonderful woodland plantings, woodland gardens, and shade gardens, including this one at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. If you've ever had a chance to visit, go tomorrow. It's a fabulous <laughs> place. <laughs> Um, and likewise, when you get into the sunnier sites, there's a wealth of perennials that find their way into our gardens. And we all use them in unique ways, and every one of our gardens, even if we started with the same plants, every one of our gardens would be different based on our tastes and our preferences and our conditions and how we might arrange those plants. So, I'm not going to talk a lot about real hardcore design, like how to design a garden, but I think if you're the type of person that likes to sketch out a plan on paper or something, uh, before you do that, before you go to the garden center or wherever to start picking out plants, there's some basic considerations. No matter what kind of gardening you're doing, whether it's vegetable gardening or perennial gardening or creating a, a container uh, or even plants in a windowsill. Uh, there's some basic things that you want to consider. And first off is considering the conditions you have. Um, you know, knowing a little bit about the site. If you have a site in mind, like, oh, I'd like to have a little garden here along the front walk to my house. Understand the type of soil you have there, the light, uh, the climate you have there, the microclimate, the exposure. And those will begin to inform the, the potentials, the, the possibilities of that site. But it also kind of exposed some challenges and the realities of the site that may be limitations. So it's good to have an understanding of, in general, what your conditions are, because that's going to inform greatly what plants you're able to grow in those conditions. And I'll get into these uh, in a little more detail in a little bit. But all this gets to that notion of selecting the right plant from the right place, right? All heard that before? <laughs> OK. Words of wisdom that uh, never get old. Um, but I just want to quickly go through a few sites that I've been involved with or have um, observed over time. And this first one is part of our garden in Grand. It's a woodland garden. And uh, that, that image on the left is a site at the top of this slope, that is this rocky slope. My wife and I wanted to develop and figured that'd be a nice spot for a little garden. So we already have a pretty good understanding of the site conditions. It's a wooded site, this high canopy that casts this. Uh, dappled shade, this filtered sunlight condition. And uh, there are a lot of bones there, a lot of good rock outcrops. And as we started to poke around, we found some deeper pockets of soil. And we thought, well, we can really enhance this site by bringing in a lot of organic matter and better soil and beef up that site to make a home for a lot of the plants we knew we wanted to grow, trilliums and some of the terrestrial orchids and woodland flocks and ferns and all these great things. So having that understanding and the ability to amend that site a little bit and adjust it to meet the needs of the plants we wanted to grow, we are able to do just that. Uh, but it's having that basic understanding of the site conditions, what our capabilities are and were, and then moving forward with the plan. And uh, you know, I think it came together pretty well. It's a site that evolves every year, changes every year. This year was a devastating year because the bulls kind of had a heyday <laughs> beneath the soil. And uh, we, we almost lost uh, that yellow lady slipper there. Um, but anyway, every year is different. Um, another site, kind of a straightforward one, this is down at Mount Holyoke in the class of 1904 garden. A number of years ago, we wanted to renovate one of the beds that had gotten overgrown, crowded, and we just wanted a new mix of plants that provide a little more throughout the season. So we had a good handle on the conditions, good soil, <coughs> good sun, um, but again, a mix of plants originally that we didn't really want to uh, deal with, so we ripped everything out amended the soil to make it better for the plants we knew we wanted to grow, and then selected the plants for the site. Um, and again, I think the, the end result was uh, pretty successful. And again, it all started understanding the conditions um, of the site where you're working. And finally, this is um, the garden of a friend of ours up in the Berkshires. Does anyone remember Blue Meadow Farm up in Montague? Okay, yeah, a few people do. Well, Brian and Alice McGowan were the owners, and they're good friends of ours now. 
and they lived in Agramont. And Brian and Alice wanted to plant a tree in this corner of their yard, so Brian took the spade to the ground and ting! You know, maybe we're here. Ting, rock, rock, rock everywhere. So he got curious. He was a little disappointed he couldn't plant his tree there. But uh, being uh, just crazed plant people, he said, what's, what's going on with this rock? Let's expose it a little bit. And this is what he exposed. Now, a lot of people might be disappointed. It's like, ah, oh, I've got rock in my yard. But not Brian. He realized that this is a real potential. This is a tremendous asset. Once he unearthed this, he found this wonderful water-worn, limestone with all these very, very deep crevices. So he's created the most amazing rock garden. I wish I had a picture to show what he's done with it. Uh, but again, it's taking a, a problem site uh, or challenge and creating something really wonderful. But it's understanding that and being able to shift your views and your perspective on what is, uh, you know, what can happen in a particular site. So um, the other aspect of understanding conditions or before you get going, is understanding yourself. Um, understanding your own tastes and your personal aesthetic. Um, understanding what purpose you're approaching a garden with. Why are you doing it? Do you just uh, do you like the activity? Do you just love gardening? Or are you doing it for some other reason? Uh, and what are your physical abilities? There's no joke that um, you know, gardening is hard work, especially if you're breaking new ground. Uh, it's, a, it's a grim reality that uh, um, we all face. Um, and also, what is your commitment of time, energy, and, and money, of course, because gardening can be an expensive endeavor. So it's understanding all these things and bringing them together to create the garden that you want that fits your needs, your purposes, as well as the site. So you can have a successful garden if you begin to gain an understanding of all these different facets. So right place, uh, right plant, right place equals the right garden for me. Um, I just want to delve into some of those other facets a little more. Um, so understanding light a little bit is important. You know, if we go to the nursery, uh, or if we're reading online, or books or catalogs, there will always be a designation of, oh, this plant is good for full sun or part shade, that sort of thing. So I think it's important to understand what those things generally mean. And full sun is typically six hours or more. Some people have the vision that unless it's sun from sunrise to sunset, they don't have full sun. But it's just six hours or more of uninterrupted sunlight. Uh, part sun, part shade, three to six hours a day, shade less than three hours. And shade is a very nuanced thing because you can have a deep shade cast by a big old sugar maple or a beech tree. You can also have a fine kind of filtered sunlight or dappled shade cast by a honey locust or an oak, high canopy of an oak tree or something. So it's really important to understand what kind of shade you have and what's casting it. Uh, and also be aware of seasonal variation. If we go out in our yards and gardens right now, before the trees leaf out, we say, oh, this is a full sun site. I'm good to go with my daisies and daylilies and all that, all that good stuff and peonies. But wait two or three weeks, and some of those sunny areas, if you have trees around, may be quite shaded. So always be aware of those seasonal variations as you approach your gardening efforts. Because I think we all, this time of year, we get a little crazed after winter. We want to go to the garden center, go to wine six or wherever, and uh, we see all these fresh new plants, and they all look so good, and one of that, and one of that, and one of that, without an understanding of where they might go. So uh, it's good to be aware of your conditions before you really dig in like that. Um, soil is essential for every garden. It's the foundation of any successful garden. And you don't need to be a soil scientist, but it really pays to have a basic understanding of what your soil is like what the texture of it is like. And what I mean by texture is, is it a really heavy clay soil? Is it a silty soil? Is it a sandy soil? Or is that magical uh, concoction of clay, silt, and sand that we call a loam? In Hadley and much of the valley, we're fortunate that we have really good soil for a lot of plants. Not for everything, um, but it's a really good soil to start off with. Uh, but understand the texture a little bit. And probably equally important is understanding how well it drains. Uh, sandy soil, of course, is going to drain really quickly. A clay soil is going to stay saturated. And that's going to dictate to a large extent what plants might grow better or worse in your conditions. Um, so yeah, have an understanding of your basic soil condition for your open garden. And also, it pays to have a little bit of an understanding of microclimates. And microclimates are those kind of little areas in your garden, in your yard, that have slightly different conditions than other areas. Um, and what I mean by that is like up against the foundation of your house, a little more protected, maybe a little warmer. 
So in those situations, you may be able to take advantage of that. If you want to get a plant like uh, something really early flowering, like some of the bulbs or hellebores, for instance, maybe planting those right up close to the foundation, they can take advantage of that extra warmth coming to bloom earlier. So instead of getting blooms in late March, you might get them earlier, you know, first or second week of March, for instance. And you know, fall and winter, those first blooms are always critical. So you know, understand those little nuanced areas in your garden. And that comes with time. You're not going to walk out and just understand that immediately. But by way of example, this picture on the right is a little stream behind our house. You can make up the water, but the bottom of that picture is a little stream. And that slope is a south-facing slope. And we have some of the same plants planted high up in the slope as well as down near the water. And that exposure um, has distinct microclimates up and down that slope. The same plant will start blooming, let's say, in the first week of April, way up high on the slope because it's freer draining, the soil warms faster, it gets more sunlight. And that same plant down the slope might start to flower two weeks later because it's lower down on the slope. It's in that cool, wet soil that stays wetter, colder, longer, so the plants emerge more slowly. So it's that kind of understanding that you can use to your advantage or just um, you know, feed into the mix of what plants you select and uh, how you treat and approach your site. Is everyone familiar with this, vaguely familiar with the USDA hardiness zone map? <laughs> okay, um, but basically what it is, it's, it's an effort to divide the country up into zones based on the average annual minimum temperature. And basically, you know, obviously farther north you go, it's colder, and uh, you know, farther south it's warmer. Um, but when you zero in, you can go to the USDA, web USDA website and actually put in your actual address and it'll whoop, zero right in on your specific location to determine what your zone is. Uh, and here in Hadley, and most of the valley, we're either a warm zone six, or rather cold zone six, or warm zone five. And basically, it's a good starting point. I don't want to dwell too much on the map itself, but it's a good starting point. But it isn't gospel. Uh, the thing to understand about plant hardiness is that it's not an exact science. Yeah, Ray, do you have a question? When you say a warm zone five, would that be a five B? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, within each 10 degree range, like zone five, typically would experience an average minimum low of minus 10 to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas zone six would be zero to minus 10. And each one is divided up into a five degree section. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're good. Oh, good. OK. Uh, so anyway, but it's not an exact science. There's no government entity or industry group, group that's out there testing every single plant under lab conditions to understand where the breaking point is in terms of cold hardiness. Cold hardiness is only one factor in determining whether a plant's adaptable to your garden. I have friends up in far northern Vermont that can grow things uh, beautifully, and they get to 30, 40 below zero on a pretty regular basis up there. They have things they grow really well that we cannot grow at all here. And it's nothing to do with winter cold. It has everything to do with summer heat, summer humidity, and the, the conditions that imposes on the plants. <coughs> and a lot of those plants just don't tolerate day after day of 80s and 90s, uh, whereas up in northern Vermont, they don't get it hot in general, and it usually drops down at night quite a bit. So there's a lot more to plant hardiness and adaptability than just winter cold, as well as uh, summer heat as well. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into it. But again, the hardiness zone map is a starting point, but don't take it as gospel. Don't look at the tag and say, oh, that's rated as zone six. I'm in zone five. I can't grow that. Try it. You might be pleasantly surprised. Um, who's comfortable using color in the garden? Combining colors. Okay, a few people are comfortable. A lot of people aren't. A lot of people are scared of color. I'm scared of color. <laughs> uh, it terrifies me to think, oh, is this going to work together or not? Uh, but if you're comfortable with color, go for it. Uh, if you're not comfortable with color, go for it. Uh, you know, there are some basic guidelines that, particularly if you're apprehensive about combining colors, uh, there's some guidelines that will help you make good combinations if you have an understanding of the plants you're working with, that sort of thing. Um, and the color wheel is a great tool. I'm sure most of us have seen the color wheel, um, basically dividing the spectrum up 
spectrum in this circular pattern. Um, primary colors, of course, yellow, red, and blue. But um, I guess the big idea here is that if you're comfortable using color, go for it. If you're not, um, you can utilize some of these, some of these tools, some of these guidelines to create effective color combination. But one thing I'm quick to say is that um, you know, if you like something, just go for it, even if it doesn't abide by one of these so-called rules. Um, I like to like, uh, I like to compare a lot of horticulture and gardening to food and cooking. And if you like peanut butter and dill pickle sandwiches, go for it. <laughs> if you like to combine the most brazen and harshest colors together, go for it. Uh, because again, gardening should be very personal, and you know, unless you're gardening for someone else or creating a garden for someone else, do what you want to do. And if it makes you happy, that's great. Um, but in terms of combining color, the easiest approach is a monochromatic scheme, where you focus on one color and utilize various shades and hues and tones of that one color. That will always work. And it's a simple approach. I mean, there's great gardens around the world. Uh, at Sissinghurst in England, one of the gardens we visited, uh, there's a famous white garden. It wasn't blue when we were there, but it's all <coughs> white. A very simple monochromatic scheme that they've implemented there to great effect. Uh, another approach is using complementary colors. Those are utilizing colors that are diametrically opposed to each other on the color wheel. Some really bold combinations there, red and green, uh, purple, violet, and orange, and things like that. So really bold color combinations. And finally, there's analogous color schemes to utilize, and that's taking two, three, or four wedges of the color wheel and utilizing plants that share those colors or that have those colors in them and combining them. And again, you can come up with some really bold combinations utilizing analogous colors, but you can't go too far wrong as far as general appeal and acceptability um, with any of those schemes, the monochromatic, the complementary, or the analogous color schemes. Um, what I'd like to do now is spend most of the rest of the time just kind of talking about a range of plants. I had a heck of a time whittling down the range of plants I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about uh, some plants that some of you likely know, but I also want to highlight a lot of plants you might not be familiar with or may just be kind of generally aware but don't, don't know a lot about them. So we'll take a little journey down the, down the garden path and highlight some plants. I really hesitated to include daylilies, a, a classic perennial that I'm sure pretty much everyone's familiar with on one level or another. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about daylilies, um, but if you're not too familiar with them, I want to expand your horizons. A lot of people think of daylilies and think of ditch lilies, the orange ones, or they think of daylilies just being yellow. They're yellow or orange and that's it. Um, this is just a sampling of, of some of the colors that can be found in the world of daylilies. And these all have very similar floral shapes, but there are spider type daylilies, there are ones that are double, there are small flowers, larger flowers, there's a whole variety of flower shapes within the world of daylilies. They vary in height from you know, little 12, 15 inch ones to ones that are taller than me. And a bloom, <coughs> a bloom season ranges from maybe mid-June all the way through September or early October. There's a tremendous <coughs> diversity in the range, uh, or in the genus, Hemorrhicalis, in the world of daylilies. So just wanted to mention those and kind of highlight that. But we'll move on to some juicier things and some plants that I get really excited about. You'll probably hear me prefacing every slide, but I'm really excited about this one. <laughs> it's hard to not be excited about this. Uh, the genus Amstonia, uh, Blue Star, is uh, a small genus. It's native exclusively to North America, except for one outlier that occurs in far eastern Asia. But virtually all the ones that we find at nurseries and garden centers <coughs> are native ones to North America. And the one that's been probably the most popular over the years is this one called Antonia Taverna Montana, uh, which is a robust perennial that gets up to three or four feet tall, a stalwart perennial, clump forming, drought tolerant, sun loving, and in May, mid to late May, it's just a, just a wash with these pale blue flowers. And uh, beyond that, the flowers for three or four weeks or so. But beyond that, it really holds its own in the garden. It has a very shrub-like presence. It's completely herbaceous, but it flowers, the flowers go by, and then it maintains its stature, kind of like peonies do. They're kind of just there, right through the entire season. And Amsonias are just like that as well. Um, 
And there's been a lot of interest in selecting different new forms of Amazonia. And this is one called short stack, a little dwarf guy, maybe 15 inches tall, that maybe you'll be able to find at garden centers coming up. And some of these plants aren't necessarily readily available. Um, you know, certainly I can find many of these at Home Depot or Lowe's or places like that. Uh, but at the garden center at Wine Six, at Bay State Perennial Farm, we have some wonderful resources for plants right here in the area. Um, but yeah, just great plants. So it combines the same characteristics of that first plant, the blue flowers, <coughs> the clump forming nature, and just long lived, <coughs> drought tolerant uh, perennial. One that I would take to my desert island if I could choose only 10 plants would be Amazonia cubrichtii. <coughs> it's probably really growing on desert island, but I would take it there nonetheless. Uh, Threadleaf blue star has the same flowers, the same pale blue flowers, but it has this wonderful. Uh, filigree foliage, very fine, uh, willowy foliage. And it does something in the fall that's really unique to perennials. Uh, we think of trees and shrubs as turning wonderful colors in the fall, which many do. Most perennials don't. Right? Most perennials just kind of, you know, they die in the frost and that's that. Uh, but Amsonia hubrichtii turns this wonderful shade of yellow or butterscotch. And then even once the, the hard frost comes and the growth really stops, uh, it has good structure. So I always encourage people, when plants still hold their structure, you know, if you like to look at them, leave them, because there are a lot of insects that may be overwintering there, but they also provide a lot of interest in the winter garden. I just think that's beautiful, that top shot there, covered in frost, and, uh, you know, might see us through, through part of the winter anyway. Um, growing up, my mother and my grandmother always had pea bush. Uh, at least that's what she called it. And uh, I came to know it as Baptisia australis, uh, false indigo. But it's one of the plants I have a long history with, uh, not only in my life, but also admiring it and enjoying it in garden settings. And Baptisias have come a long way in recent years. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in, in breeding them, selecting unique color forms. And what once was restricted to just a well-known purple flower Baptisia, has really blossomed into a whole tapestry of colors, from yellows to whites, to some burnished orange, uh, darker purples, um, just some wonderful variations in the world of Baptisia. And like the Amsonias, they're strictly clump forming plants. They get bigger and bigger each year. They're not invasive, super long lived, super drought tolerant, and they're just fabulous perennials for a sunny garden. Does anyone grow any Baptisias? Okay, yeah, good, good. I like that. I transplanted the blue one mm -hmm. a year ago, and then it refused to all the from that time. Yeah, they're tricky to move because they have very, they don't have really fibrous root systems. They have a system, they have a big, fleshy, uh, almost like peony roots. Uh, so they have very few fibrous roots, and so transplanting them can be tricky. Um, I've done it, but not always successfully. So I don't know what the you know, what the solution to that is. Um, but you can grow them from cuttings. If it's growing leaves, you can propagate them from cuttings. So that's a possibility. Grow from cuttings? Yeah, stem cuttings, when the leaves come up. Is it growing, but just not flowering for yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, you can take stem cuttings and start as a younger plant, it may establish better, and then go on to bloom. When is the time for here? Uh, you'd want to do softwood cuttings in probably June. Uh, top three or four inch tip cuttings. Okay. Um, we can talk, I'll give you a few more details afterwards. Uh, but yeah, Baptisias are fantastic plants and I would not have a garden. My, my desert island's gonna get crowded in a big <laughs> um, Peonies, I think everyone knows peonies, uh, herbaceous peonies. There are also tree peonies. I'm not gonna talk about them because they're woody plants, they're shrubs. But um, in recent years, there's a group of peonies called the Ito hybrids or intersectional peonies. And they're the result of hybridization between tree peonies and the typical better known herbaceous peonies. And what these hybrids have achieved is they've brought together the, the form, the flower form of some of the tree peonies as well as some of the rich colors that tree peonies have. There's some real deep yellows and reds and oranges in some of the tree peony species from Eastern Asia. Um, and what the herbaceous peonies bring in is a smaller stature and, of course, an herbaceous plant overall. So this is just one, this Cora Louise, um, just a beautiful plant. There's one called Bartsella, which has a nice soft yellow flower, really big flowers. I mean, 
big as a softball, if not larger. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of different ones out there. Uh, they're pricey. I mean, for a two or three gallon pot, you can expect to pay 60, 80, 100 bucks. But Phoenix are long lived. They're wonderful plants. And again, they're not cheap necessarily. <laughs> um, Symphytum, kind of an unknown plant. It's a borage relative, uh, comfrey. Um, it looks like a big hosta for sun. At least this one does with those variegated leaves. Uh, and the, the leaf cluster will come up to about 15 or 18 inches tall and well established will be three or four feet around. And then eventually it'll flower. But you don't really grow for the flowers, you really grow for the foliage. And once this comes up and starts to flower, we usually cut ours back entirely and then it'll reflush and you'll be left with a wonderful rosette with these beautifully variegated leaves. And here you can see it combined with that teasing in the back, the ornamental grass, uh, Veronica Castrum here, Culver's root, and a little geranium down here. This is down at Montoya, I think. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this is one called Axminster Gold because of the, uh, the variegated green and gold foliage. Uh, Galenia, Bowman's root, another distinct clump forming perennial, native a little farther south, uh, also called Portoranthus. Uh, trifoliatus, um, long lived. This is one of the first plants that my wife and I planted in our sunny front garden, and I think this picture was taken there. And it's still there, 25 plus years later. We've never divided it, we've never moved it, we do little to it other than throw some compost around it every now and then. Uh, and every year it comes up, flowers beautifully with these very airy white and pink flowers. And there's a really exciting new introduction out of Mount Cuba Center in Delaware called Pink Profusion, which has the same overall plant characteristics, but with an all pink flower. So you know, these gardeners are always looking for something a little different, something that kind of pushes the boundaries of what's typical. Um, and this is a great example of that. Um, the world of, of milkweeds and butterfly weeds is, is pretty vast. And if you're into planting things to attract pollinators, you can scarcely go wrong planting uh, butterfly weed or swamp milkweed or one of the Asclepias. They are insect magnets that attract all sorts of things. And uh, the, the orange butterfly weed on the right there is kind of the plant for monarch butterflies. That's kind of the poster child of the pollinator world. But there's a wealth of other insects that depend uh, heavily on plants of all sorts. So when we think about planting for pollinators and wasps and bees and insects, we should think broadly. Um, but again, the Asclepias are wonderful additions, uh, not only for the beauty, but also to support insect communities. Um, another great plant for pollinators, um, so many asters and things of that family attract a tremendous range of insects. One of my favorites is the giant cone flower. And there's a couple things I really like about it. When it first emerges, it just comes up with this mass of foliage, kind of this sort of gray green, glaucus -y foliage, a little, little bit of a bluish cast, and that comes up about two or three feet. This is a robust plant. Um, and then emerging from that in mid to late summer are these tall, tall stems that get up to seven or eight feet tall, capped by these uh, yellow, and you know, these brown-eyed Susans, basically, black-eyed Susans. Uh, so it's a bold plant, and it's interesting in that it can be used just as effectively in the back of the border or back of the garden as it can be closer to the front. And you wouldn't think of planting a plant that gets to be seven or eight feet tall closer to the front of a garden or border, but this you can get away with a little bit because once those stems come up, and even though they're tall, tall stems, they have a transparency about them, so they don't hide what's behind them. I wouldn't suggest planting a little geranium behind them, but you know you can work it into the garden in interesting ways, uh, so your garden isn't so like oh everything here the front is 12 to 15 inches, next row back is two to three feet, the back is four to six feet. You know, you can stagger them to create a more of a dynamic appearance to your garden and uh, a little more visual interest. But uh, giant coneflower, a good one. And if you leave the seed head standing, it'll attract fold finches and other birds that go for the seeds as well. Sticking with the daisy family, uh, echinaceas, the coneflowers, they have had, uh, you know, a rebirth in the past 10, 15, 20 years. A tremendous amount of hybridization in Echinacea that all started at the Chicago Botanic Garden with one called Orange Meadow Bright. Uh, a lot of people have picked up on that same idea of crossing different species of Echinacea and coming up with some wonderful, wonderful plants. Tomato soup, that rich reddish orange, with even a hint of, you know, kind of a magenta purple color in there as well. 
but just a tremendous range. And again, most things in the Astor family are sun-loving, uh, and echinaceas are certainly no exception to that rule. Um, not a great <coughs> picture of this plant, but this is another one of my favorites. Um, this is a type of ironweed, letterman's ironweed, and the cultivar is iron butterfly. And it's unique in the world of ironweeds, and that's a fairly small one. This is only about mm, maybe 18 or 24 inches tall when full grown. Most ironweeds are big, bold perennials. They get four, six, eight, ten feet tall. Uh, they're all native to North America, but this one in particular, again, is a small one and really late blooming. We're talking like late September into mid-October. So it's great for, uh, for pollinators, for late season interest in the garden, and again, providing that, that nectar for late season insects as well. Uh, so rich color and wonderful foliage. They form these tiny little shrublets with this very fine foliage. So even out of bloom, it has a presence that's really quite attractive and, and wonderful. We have a nice climbing this down in front of the greenhouse in Mount Holyoke. And uh, yeah, it's right through the season. It's just a wonderful addition to the border there. But there are other Vernonias, uh, not to be confused with Veronicas, but there are other Vernonias, again, that are big, equally valuable perennials for, for sunny gardens. Um, sticking with the native theme here, again, Joe Pie weeds, another group of really bold, uh, robust perennials. Here we see it on the left. Uh, Garden and Martha's Vineyard combined with ornamental grasses, Persicaria, and then that bold, bold sweep of the Joe Pie weed. And they too are wonderful plants for attracting pollinators and just having a presence in the garden. Um, ornamental grasses. Who grows ornamental grasses of any kind in their garden? Huh? Pretty much, yeah, three quarters of you do. Um, good reason for it. They bring a lot to um, a lot to the garden. They lend a texture that really isn't found in other plants. A form, a texture, just a presence that combines really well with other plants and uh, provides a nice contrast to the, to the forms and shapes of other plants as well. Here we see a, a miscanthus combined with Allium Christophii, one of the big ornamental onions. Uh, here, the same grass, another miscanthus later in the season with its flower heads, and then a, a late season aster, and then some grass, I don't know what it is. But they're very architectural, uh, especially the bigger ones. They have a, a real presence in the garden. And most of them are sun-loving. There are a few shady ones, uh, ones that like the shade, <laughs> that I'll touch on a little bit. But again, as you can see, they just really bring something very unique to garden settings. They don't, I mean, they do flower, but they aren't really colorful flowers. They're more for their structure, for the architectural element that they bring to the landscape and to the gardens. Um, I mentioned a couple of grasses do prefer shade. One of the best is this one called Hakanakoa, or Japanese Hakoni grass. Uh, forms this mound, maybe 12 or 15 inches tall. This is one called all gold. The typical species has all green leaves. This one is selected to have that kind of yellowish green, that chartreuse foliage. There are variegated ones, uh, and there are some that have these crazy combinations of, of yellow and kind of reddish and green as well. Um, but again, they're really interesting, provide a texture that you don't often see in other plants in the garden. Another group of grass-like plants that are fairly popular are the sedges, the carex. Um, some of them are kind of weedy, but there are a lot of really good ones as well. And this is one of the best ones. When we're looking at this plant here that has the variegated leaves, it's Carex sideristicta uh, variegata. Um, wonderful element in a mixed planting as a ground cover here combined with a type of euphorbia. Um, and again, really for the foliage, for the form, for the texture, not so much the flowers. They do flower, but they're pretty, pretty darn insignificant. Um, so since we're on the topic of plants for shade sites or woodlands, I want to kind of delve into that a little bit. And it really is just a tremendously rich variety of plants for shaded gardens, for woodland settings. And just back up for one second. There's a lot of flowers going on here, um, a lot of flowers in bloom here. Uh, we've got phlox up top, we've got epimedium, we've got something called eomacon, and the big yellow uh, lady slipper. So color is important, of course, but I think this planting is equally successful as well. There's not a single flower in sight there, but just the way the different textures and shades of green have been combined it makes a really effective planting, in my mind. Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, is think beyond just the blooms. Think about, you know, again, the textures you're combining, the colors, 
because you can create a wonderful garden. Because most perennials don't flower for more than three or four weeks. There are some that do, but most perennials, they have a fairly limited window of bloom time. Um, I can and I have gone on for many hours about ferns, <laughs> right, about ferns. Uh, but they are sort of like, uh, they bring to the shady garden what grasses bring to sunnier sites in general. There are ferns that like sun, but for the most part, they're lovers of shade. But they bring a certain structure, a form, an elegance, and uh, we have a lot of native ones that are wonderful additions to our garden. Growing up in North Hadley, going down to the Connecticut River, I remember as a little kid going through little forests of ostrich fern. And ostrich fern is the fern that if you've eaten fiddleheads, uh, it's the emerging shoots of this fern here on the, on the left that you'd be eating. Um, but yeah, it's a vigorous fern, it's a big fern, three to four feet tall, um, but wow, it packs, packs a punch in terms of its visual, um, visual element that brings us to the garden. On the right there, we've got a couple other native ferns. The, the lighter green one is maidenhair fern, a very elegant uh, fern with those palmate fronds. And then a darker green one is Christmas fern, which people are always wondering about, what's a good plant to grow in dry shade? And Christmas fern is always one of my go-to things, because if you see it growing naturally around here, you can find it growing under hemlock. And if you know hemlocks, it's dark beneath hemlocks, it's dry beneath hemlocks, and there they are, toughing it out, and looking pretty good. Um, so a lot of ferns for a lot of different sites. But just the way they emerge is elegant and, uh, and so desirable. And the way they combine and contrast with other woodland plants is pretty special. Um, but just to touch on maidenhair fern once again, uh, just the, the epitome of elegance in the garden. It's a clump forming fern that deploys its fronds in almost a horizontal manner, almost a horseshoe shape or palmate fashion. Here we see it combined with um, that grass for shade, that hack and chloe grass that I mentioned earlier. Um, and here's Christmas fern combined with a couple other natives. We've got our native pack of Sandra and a swath of the Christmas fern. And again, no flowers there, but an equally effective planting, I think. Again, ostrich fern. If you've eaten fiddleheads, that's what you're eating. <laughs> uh, but again, just a, just a wonderful fern and uh, bold. If you're planting ostrich fern, beware that it will spread. It's a vigorous fern and it can easily crowd out of things. So, if you want to grow ostrich fern, just be prepared to curtail its efforts to overtake your yard, uh, or don't plant it, or plant it somewhere where you really just can let it, let it go free. Um, Epimediums, uh, we're within an hour's drive of probably the uh, best nursery for Epimediums in the entire world. Sadly, the nursery's going out of business, a place called Garden Vision up in Petersham. Um, but there's just a tremendous wealth of epimediums. They're all Eastern Asian plants, but they're great plants for shady sites, and they'll even eat it out in, again, fairly dry, uh, deep shade. They're not at their best in those conditions, but they will survive. But they tend to be fairly low plants. Most of them are in the 12 to 15 inch range. Some are spreaders, some are clumpers, but they tend to flower fairly early in the season, usually late April, early May. There's several in our garden that are in full bloom right now. Um, but just wonderful plants, tough plants, um, deer resistant. Um, they don't have really any problems to speak of. Uh, so if you haven't introduced yourself to epimediums, definitely make their acquaintance because they are great plants. Um, a couple things, when I mentioned the life cycle plants, I mentioned annuals briefly, I cited marigolds and cosmos and zinnias, and I stopped short of saying impatience because even though most of the impatience that most of us probably know and grow are annuals in fact, but there are some cold hardy perennial ones that come from Far Eastern Asia and Central China. Uh, and on the right is one called Impatience omiensis, um, which is a slow plant to get going in the spring. It won't be up until mid to late May, if not early June, so it rises slowly. Uh, and the flowers aren't anything terribly spectacular. They're largely concealed, you know, kind of down amongst the foliage. But the foliage alone is reason enough to grow this plant. That wonderful kind of natural variegation, that midrib is a lighter color. And this is a plant that wants a rich, woodsy soil. And they'll come up to about maybe 12, 15 inches tall. Uh, it'll gradually spread and kind of find where it's happiest. But it's a wonderful plant to mix in with other perennials and uh, even shrubs to mix with the hydrangea. The other one that kind of surprises people is that there are hardy begonias. There's only a few. We think of begonias as like bedding plants or maybe house plants. 
But this one in particular, Begonia grandis, has these big, bold, begonia-like leaves. Not begonia-like, it is a begonia. Uh, and then pink flowers late in the season, like September, October. It too is late to rise in the spring, um, but it's a wonderful plant. So again, just kind of encouraging you to think beyond the, the, the hostas and things like that. Uh, another plant that people aren't too familiar with is Spigelia marylandica, the Maryland pink root. Believe it or not, this is related to butterfly bush, such is the nature of taxonomy. Um, but a plant that'll get words of about two feet tall, uh, clump forming, and it really flowers after the main flush of spring plants that bloom. We think of woodland gardens, shade gardens as really being their best, you know, April, May, maybe early June. This really comes in, into its own as far as blooming in uh, early to mid-summer, so on towards June, early July, with these really bright red flowers that open to reveal that chartreuse interior, so it's a really striking con contrast. Um, so definitely a good one to, to keep an eye out for. Um, hellebores have really come into their own in recent years. It used to be that if you knew hellebores, you could, uh, you know, you'd probably think they're green or maybe white. But in recent years, it's just been a tremendous effort to breed new forms, new color combinations, especially reds. Um, red, really true red getting away from purple has been a key goal of a lot of hybridizers. And there's just a tremendous variation out there right now. Good long lived plants and super early. They're done blooming already. They flower in a really mild year. They can start as early as February. Uh, March is their, is their month, primarily. Uh, so super early blooming and just tough as nails and uh, a good stalwart plant. Um, and finally, we're getting to the end here, so bear with me. Um, wild gingers. Uh, we've got some native ones, and there's a whole bunch that occur in Eastern Asia. And these are a few that I think are really good selections. Uh, Air Serum Shuttleworthii is one of the native ones in the southeastern U.S. with those finely marbled and uh, variegated leaves, natural variegation. The one in the middle of the Serum Splendids is a Chinese species with that, again, a natural variegation, that silvery wash to the leaves. And one of the best as a ground cover is our native uh, Canada wild ginger, which grows naturally around here, and up, well, especially up towards the Berkshires, you're more likely to encounter it. But these nice heart-shaped leaves, and a spreading habit. The flowers are largely underneath the foliage. They're interesting, but they're not visually significant in the garden. You have to get down your hands and knees and kind of peer under the foliage to find the flowers. They're interesting, but uh, not necessarily beautiful. Um, just want to mention the stilbies briefly. Um, the stilbies that some of you may know and grow are largely German hybrids from the last century, early part of the last century, early 1900s. Uh, and one similar to that, which are wonderful plants for the garden. Uh, we do have one native one that grows in the southern Appalachians on the right there. It's a big perennial, four or five feet tall. Uh, looks, if you're familiar with goat's beard, Aruncus dioicus, it's very similar to that in appearance. And it's a big, bold plant, loves woodland edge conditions, rich, deep soil, and uh, big, bold foliage above which rise this mass of creamy white flowers. So a really bold plant, especially compared with the smaller, you know, the typical facilities that are usually 15, 18, 24 inches tall, which are wonderful plants. Um, but again, just introducing you to something a little different, maybe something you're not aware of. Um, Brunera, an Asian plant, um, but a great plant for foliage effect alone. Comes up early in the spring with these one, this form anyway, Jack Frost, with the silvery variegated leaf. Uh, combined with these pale blue flowers that are uh, like a forget-me-not. It's in the same family as forget-me-nots. Um, this is a plant that, again, comes up early, flowers early, but then by uh, early summer or so, it's starting to look a little bit draggled. So the best thing to do with a plant like this, as you can do with a lot of geraniums, the perennial geraniums, is once they start to kind of go over a little bit, just cut them back completely, give them a little bit of fertilizer, keep them watered, and they'll reflush. Uh, they may not re-bloom, but a plant like this, you're really growing it primarily for the foliage. So if you can deal with a few weeks of it looking a little, uh, you know, just bare basically, uh, it will reflush and kind of carry you through the season with fresh foliage. Um, and finally, one of my favorites, again, there's a lot of favorites, um, <laughs> is a little diminutive iris that's native to the southeastern U.S., uh, Iris cristata, dwarf, uh, dwarf crested iris. Uh, just a lot of different forms of it. 
Um, you probably can't read it and transfer that to a white font, but eco purple. Uh, huh. uh, Tennessee white and then Vane Mountain. But there's a lot of different forms uh, using the range of white, purple, violet. Uh, but just wonderful ground cover iris. They can get all, all of six inches tall, but they'll carpet in the area. And uh, ours are just starting to bloom. So late April, early May flowering plant. And that's, that's their season. Um, but just wonderful plants for woodland edge and filling in around other larger plants. So with that, obey the garden signs. Do not pass without admiring. <laughs> and um, yeah, I have to take questions if there are any. The last average you show us is, uh, is not the ball, right? Right. This is, uh, there are, there's, a, there's a slender rhizome, but it's not a ball. Um, so and it's fibrous rooted. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll spread and spread, and they're, they're hardy, they're long lived. Uh, Do you ever see that thing from in the area? Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen it over at Bay State Perennial Farm, um, over in Waitley. Uh, but it's not uncommon. It's not, you know, it's not one of the most commonly grown iris, but uh, you can definitely find it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Are there any perennials that do not like mulch? That do not like what? Do not like mulch. Um, <laughs> if you're talking about Perennials that are growing in like a typical border. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I would say that, you know, when we mulch trees, for instance, it's always recommended to keep the mulch a little bit away from the trunk of a tree or any, you know, any woody plant. Um, and I would say probably the same thing is, is a good idea for perennials as well. Um, to keep the mulch a little bit back from, you know, especially clump forming perennials. Uh, but I'm not aware of any that really don't like it. I suppose if the mulch is too heavy, if, uh, if there's too deep a layer, or if there's really dense mulch, like if, you, if you're mulching with compost, which I really like to use, uh, if it's too much of a layer, it's too dense, if the compost is too dense, some perennials, and I don't know enough about which ones specifically, but may have trouble pushing up through it. So if you're unsure, it's best to maybe mulch just after things start to come up so you can kind of work around them a little bit. Um, but if you get in the realm of, of you know, alpine plants, for instance, they like being mulched, but not with bark mulch or compost or anything like that. They want to be mulched with like a, a stone chip, you know, gritty mulch, yeah, which is more this, akin to what. I mean, we're talking about bark mulch. Yeah. Usually what we do around here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bark mulch is a good thing. I mean, I tend towards, um, you know, again, towards compost or shredded leaves. But you know, bark mulch is readily available. It's yeah, it does all the things that mulch does. So. But after time, you get really sick. <laughs> well, yes, yes, there is that. It's good exercise, though. Yeah. Any other questions? What do you suggest for general fertilizer for a garden that has all different kinds of plants? How often and what kind? Um, my approach is pretty straightforward. You know, for our general perennial beds at, at the college, as well as others that I take care of. Um, usually there's a spring application like this time of year, something like garden <coughs> uh, which is an Espoma product. It's a, an organic fertilizer, something like that, just a general purpose fertilizer, whatever the bag recommends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, if, if you've prepared the soil well and if the plants that you've selected are adapted to those conditions in general, most things don't need to be you know, fed regularly or heavily anyway. Um, you know, there are exceptions, some things like, like peonies, for instance, they're pretty, pretty heavy feeders, and some of the iris are as well, like Siberian iris, they're kind of greedy in a way, so fertilizing some of those, or top dressing the compost would be And for the peonies, you use that same fertilizer? Yeah. yeah. I've never fertilized my peonies, mm -hmm. but... They look pretty good, so I don't know if I want to fool around. Yeah, that's, that's the thing with a lot of gardening, I mean, you know, there are these rules that people lay down, um, but if your garden is healthy and you're getting really out of oil plants, ones, you know, they came from my aunt's garden and they probably came from her mother's, you know what yeah. I mean? They're really old, old, old. Yeah. yeah. And again, a lot of soil in this area is, is really good. Yeah. Um, with a lot of nutrients, a lot of stuff plants need to begin with. Um, but, you know, it does vary, of course. Yeah. Speaking of peonies, um, I have 
there's some kind of little tiny bug that crawls around in sidelines. Somebody told me they're supposed to be helping something, but is that true? Um, it could be ants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. make peony buds secrete some sugars and that sort but of thing. I mean, can you not have them? Or so, you, so you can bring them in the house? <laughs> well, you kind of have to deal with them. <laughs> Pick them off or do something. Or yeah. enjoy, enjoy the ants as well. Spread yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's up to you. I don't think there's any need to. They're, they're not hurting the plants. No, I just, I'd love to bring them in the house. Because they smell so bad. And I, yeah. I, I will not be in here, so. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's enough. Thank you. Yeah. Shake them. Yeah. They may be less active in the morning. In the morning. Yeah. So cool, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Try that out. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned bowls earlier. Yes. I thought it was just me. No, no. It's so good to, to hear, because I have a wicked infestation of them. So is there, how do you suggest I took up with Dakin, see what they have for cats. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, they're, they're tough to control, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, cats will help a little bit, but our cats are lazy, so we have problems. Um, you know, you can set traps. Uh, I, I really hesitate to use poisons because, you know, for any rodents, because the, the target animal, even if, even if only the target animal, the mole, the mice, whatever it is, eat that. They go out in the world, and then an owl comes along before they die and scoop them up, and then you're kind of getting that poison into a larger part of the food right. system. So I, I tend to avoid poisons. So trapping is a possibility. Uh, I've never gotten to that point where I've really gotten so frustrated I need to set traps. But I would recommend if you do traps, is maybe get a, a section of, you know, two or three foot section of PVC pipe and put the trap in that. So only something really small is going to get a trap. You know, something else isn't going to come along and have a trap attached to its leg for, you know, for coming two or three years or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best course of action. There are kind of mechanical traps that will actually you know, skewer them, but you know you have to know where their runs are and you know, you excavate the site. Um, and those are maybe more effective in the lawn areas. Um, I've never used those, so I think you know a baited trap is probably the best way to go. And, uh, yeah, and hope for uh, a healthy uh, <laughs> predator population. There's a New Hampshire pasta company, and they they have a formula they spray with castor oil. And I don't know if it's soap or uh, something else. Because huh. the main ingredient is castor oil. Hmm. The guy okay. wanted to do that. I don't think it's poisonous in the other animal. It just repels the bulls primarily. Okay, so it's more of a deterrent than something that's going to harm them. Okay. Right. Good tip. Castor oil. Well, to your neighbors, caution. Sure. they'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you use compost instead of bark mulch in your gardens? Yes. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Bark mulch really. Um, in general, I'm going away from the bark mulch. I mean, it's, it still has application. It's still good for a lot of things. But bark mulch, even as it breaks down, it doesn't really add much to the soil. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, go, if, you, if you use bark mulch in an area for a number of years, if you dig down, you're not going to get to a nice humusy layer. You get to kind of this fine duff-like layer that's almost like peat moss. It's almost hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. So it's not really helping the soil. It's keeping the weeds down, yes. It's keeping moisture in, which is all good stuff. It's moderating the soil temperature. But as far as improving the soil, it's not really helping. Whereas you know, compost certainly will. That will find its way in through you know, your activity in the garden as well as worms and other things. Um, and it improves the biological you know, community in the soil, which is really important to the health of our gardens overall, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I'm also going, I don't, visually I'm kind of coming to grips with the use of composted wood chips, not the fresh chips that Arborists might have or tree care companies, but some of the companies will actually pile those chips up and actually actively compost them, mm -hmm. let them break down a little bit so you get, um, you know, a more acceptable <laughs> product, and sometimes you get it screened so it has a more consistent look, so you know, these big stringy branches and bits yeah. of bark and stuff like that. But that is, in my estimation, preferable, in terms of the health of the guard, preferable to bark mulch. Visually, a lot of people kind of balk at it because it's often not consistent, often has an unacceptable color, you know, often just light. But biologically, in terms of improving soil, composted wood chips, I'd say, are vastly superior to 
Can we put it over old wood chips, or you have to get rid of the wood chips and then put the compost down? Um, I would say you could, you know, layer it on. You know, if you have a substantial layer already, you, know, you may not need to add too much. You know, you don't need to do two inches, right, two or three right. inches every year necessarily. That's going to be kind of a case by case basis. Yeah. Other questions? I can hang around later. <laughs> Folks have other questions they want to talk in depth about anything. But, um, Thank you all. Thank you.